Yeah, welcome to um, the guests and Gusto Sketch virtual series of um, the conversations and digital content with the uh, creators and innovators remarking culture, remaking culture. Uh, I'm BC Huang. I'm happy to introduce James Lee today. Um, James Lee is the, the executive director and the head of user experience and design at Pulse Secure a network and cybersecurity company. Uh, he is an industry leader and produces innovative um, products that integrate the essential elements of everyday life with design to improve productivity and quality. And today we are going to explore the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the roles and responsibilities of design professionals and career aspirations for SCAT students in the tech space. Make sure you follow James uh, on Instagram at JamesK617. Um, today's poll question, we're going to have uh, the poll and um, now it is time for our poll question. And um, today you have a chance to win the UX book Agile UX design for a quality user experience. After the conversation, we'll have a brief uh, moment to ask James a few questions. So please um, have them ready to go. So, and now we are ready to go, James. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the generous introduction. And <laughs> I'm glad to see everybody here. And I do see a couple of familiar faces as I actually participated in this professional mentorship last year. Um, so um, I will briefly introduce uh, myself uh, here. So I'm James Lee. Um, the, the Instagram that BC has mentioned is not ne necessarily anything professional. It's just on my personal stuff. So unless you're... Um, you know, interested in who I am in other part of the work, uh, I'd be happy to connect. Uh, it's just as generally speaking, besides work, these are the things that I usually do. So I like doing hands-on work, woodwork, and then uh, do other clay modeling and things like that. Um, another thing is, let me see if I can, Nope. Okay. Uh, here we go. So as you can see, uh, some of these images are just a representative to uh, the professional work that I've done so far. And on the left side, I listed out some of the organizations that I've been through uh, in and leading the, organi the design organizations throughout my career. So this is uh, roughly about I would say 10 years worth of work. And then prior to that 10 years, uh, it's just, I, don't, I didn't think it was that much relevant. So these are some of the products that uh, most of you may be able to recognize. So uh, I'm coming from very heavy consumer products. So the mobile devices and the wearables. And also I uh, recently um, had an opportunity to the head of design departments in Lucid Motors. And uh, back in the Microsoft, uh, again, it was a more about the consumer products like the Xbox and Zoom MP3 players. Uh, so yeah, so long, I don't mean to dwell too much on my background, but as we're having conversations and making these things much more interactive, I'll be happy to share any case studies or any insights that I've gained over the course of my career. And I'll be happy to answer any questions um, regarding what could be expected uh, going into the professional field. And particularly, um, I, if there's an opportunity, I'd like to touch on some topics regarding uh, what's our roles and responsibilities as a design uh, individual and talents in this type of uh, the pandemic at the time. Uh, there might be some opportunities that we haven't necessarily tapped on. Uh, so I'll be happy to discuss about that as well. 
All right. So I'm switching to show my face. So uh, Bessie, would you like to pick out some questions uh, to start with and so that we can get to some conversation going on? Um, we don't have yet um, the, the student side, the questions, but uh, the poll result was the emerging trend in UX design. We have our most um, the answer like a 54%. So, if you can focus on that, I guess it might be like a most um, student want to hear from you today. Okay. Um, I'm just going to assume that majority of uh, the participants today are somewhat related to design field. Um, if that's a safe assumption. Um, I, I'm not sure if there is one or two uh, clear things that I can call out as a trend, but at least what's definitely happening right now is when it comes to product space, uh, a lot of the organizations are looking into systematic approach. Uh, so uh, perhaps most of you have heard about the design systems and then UI libraries. So most of these organizations are trying to systematically build things so that it becomes more scalable and sustainable. Um, so unless we have the system like the, uh, the asset libraries where both engineers and designers are coming to the central source of truth so that they can pull those assets to continue to build applications. Um, so that in the end, when you have a multiple products, like multiple applications, they sort of have the similar look and feel so that you can keep the consistency uh, for future customers because a lot of the times the customers do have some uh, concerns regarding how some of the experience might be slightly different so that they get confused uh, whether the a type of product can be related or connected to uh, other type of uh, products because a lot of the times you don't necessarily use only one application uh, so using the multiple applications in the field from the customer perspective, they usually like to uh, purchase more integrated from the ecosystem perspective that, that they can actually do a lot of auto automations uh, in, in more of a seamless way. So I would say uh, when it comes to trend, I think that the holistic view of the system medical approach so some people call it design system, some people call it just experience system, but the systematic approach and also centralized location of putting all the design assets so that uh, regardless of the teams, they always come to the same location to pull uh, the, the assets to build applications. I hope that makes sense to you. Um, one more thing that I'd like to add on, on top of the design system is also now uh, even the enterprise industry um, is really investing a lot into visual communication. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, I uh, came from very heavy consumer products, which they do care uh, quite a bit about the visual language. But when it comes to enterprise, it's more about the functionalities and an engineering driven uh, the nature. But I feel that perhaps the past three to four years, this whole visual communication has been very, very hot topic. So uh, th these organizations started looking for more visual talents. But when I say the visual talents, it doesn't necessarily mean it's just the graphic design, but somebody who actually understands the uh, overall, uh, the, the process, meaning like they know, understand the information architecture and perhaps the user flows and things like that. And then have the deep core competency in visual language communication that, um, it empowers the look and feel on, on the products. Okay.
we have some the questions coming in, so you wanna yeah, no worries. The question? Um, if anybody wants to stick or throw any questions, I'd be happy to uh, take that and then discuss as well. Okay, so um, the, the first question, um, what can you do in outside of education to build um, design skills that are in demand? Um, I think this is perhaps regarding more on the tool side. So we do have a lot of tools. Uh, Tangibly speaking, I think my team has been using Sketch quite a bit. Uh, and then we also use Zeppelin for all the specs. So it, uh, be, um, because I am in the, the product centric uh, the field, we always work with engineers. So when it comes to communication between the design and an engineers, the Zeppelin comes in really handy because it, it just gives the, the actual measure value to the engineers to be able to actually code. So it reduces a lot of guesswork. Uh, so I think the Sketch and Zeppelin being more primary design tool for us to use. But that being said, uh, we've been um, entertaining with the Envision and Figma um, and also uh, there are a couple other tools like ProtoPy, I'm not sure if you're familiar with. Um, so a lot of the prototype tools that has um, have become very, very important because nowadays, um, including myself, all the senior leaders, they actually like to see interactive prototypes uh, rather than hearing about the, the whole storyline of articulations. The storytelling is very, very uh, the critical in, in, the, in the early stage of uh, all the products. But as we go along in trying to make the proof of concept and then putting it into the production and all the way to the, the release cycles, that, it, that keeping the integrated design and an actual strategy going in, the prototype comes in extremely handy. So I particularly am very, very keen on prototypes. Uh, so somebody comes in and uh, telling me about some functionality with the aesthetic versus somebody actually just hand me a phone or a tablet or even a laptop for me to be able to just uh, click through and then uh, interact with. Uh, it just makes, it makes the world a difference. So I highly encourage everybody, especially on the younger part of, early part of the career stage, uh, that everybody's in, I think the prototype comes in extremely handy. And then I actually highly encourage everybody to make the portfolio along with as many interactive prototypes as possible. All right, so the second question, um, it's about your, I think, um, previous uh, Microsoft experience about um, the the console kind of thing. So between mm -hmm. PC and the console. And um, the one of one student um, interesting to hear from you. Um, did you find more success in leaning into the unique console experience or did you find yourself comparing your, your work to the PC gaming experience? I have to say it was a little bit of both. Uh, the back in that time when I was involved in Xbox console, so I was leading a design team for the console interface. Uh, so I wasn't necessarily developing a game, but being the central point of view in the, the console, I think one of the benchmarks that we have done quite a bit was actually PC games. We were trying to understand how the interface would look like in, in PC games. Because at the end of the day, everybody's going to sit by the desk and then they're going to play the game. But the console was rather a different culture that we were trying to create where you can actually use the D-pad, which is the controller that you can play with. But at the same time, as we're developing what we call the Xbox Connect, that was the, the infrared sensor that, that de detected gestures so that we wanted to actually uh, encourage our users to get up and actually play physically. 
so that perspective, the PC game wasn't necessarily relevant at that point, but rather uh, we were more inspired by uh, some of the, uh, the films, like the Minority Reports and uh, some of the other very much sci-fi and cyber type of movies that, that we were trying to get inspiration from. Did I necessarily you know, put myself in a position where I need to compare uh, with some of the other aspects? Yeah, I have to say, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was quite a bit uh, because it's always tough when you are in the forefront for pioneering something that has not been done before. Uh, so that the challenge was like, how do I actually see any reference point that is not necessarily existing at that time? But historically speaking, like we are always like doing a lot of benchmarks, just collecting a lot of information about what other companies have done. And obviously PlayStation was uh, right next to our shoulder. So, and also the Nintendo as well. But we also did a lot of the historical research and benchmarks on like Sega um, and, and some of the very, very old, uh, the, the game platform uh, with the console. Yeah. And I have a very interesting question. Since you are like a head of um, the UX design at Lucid and also the current the security um, the company, and one, um, the question might be, what are the most important qualities you look for in candidates when looking to build a design team? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a great question. I mean, hopefully this will resonate to everybody. Um, I talk about this the T shaped designer quite a bit. Uh, this every time I look for talents, one thing for sure that I'm always very keen on is what's their core competency. Uh, you can say you are aware and you are capable of doing many different things, but if there's one or two things that you're just really really good at, then what could that be? So, for example, let's say. You are a uh, user experience designer that's very, very specialized in visual communication. Or your UX designer that's extremely specialized in uh, system architecture. So there are many different angles to look at, but uh, when it comes to talent pool, I, I try to look at the deep pool of what's the uh, the core competency, and also what are the general knowledge that uh, the, that talents actually uh, talents are aware of. So that makes the top of the T, and then your core, core competency makes the pole uh, to the bottom. So that's what I meant by the T shape. Um, one thing I also want to add to this is that there are a lot of uh, the nuance in generalists. Uh, so. Um, I don't think there is a clear definition of what the product designer really means versus like UX designer versus UI designers. It, at the end of the day, we're all designers. We're all like-minded uh, talents. At the same time, we just need to make sure that what our core competency is that representing who I am. Um, so I think that's actually very important in an Truth to be told, that is really the quality I'm looking for every time I try to hire folks. Great. Um, some of um, our students, you know, they still like um, unsure they are in the right place. I mean, in the like a UX area. So yeah. um, what personality types or personal skills are the best suited to be like a UX designers? I remember yesterday throughout class, I think her name was Bailey. Uh, she actually mentioned about how she's such an introvert um, thinking that, you know, her ability or willingness to speak out loud is rather uh, less than others. So that she was a little bit concerned about if this is the, the right path to go. But I think in my opinion here, whether you feel like you are in the right space or not, 
in this case, in, in the school, you're in the, in the right major or not. Um, I would say do whatever you can and how much ever you can. Uh, you are um, in, in a platform where you have un, like limited amount of um, possibilities. You, you know, to, to be completely honest here, I, I would love to actually switch the role. I would love to be in your shoes where I can explore so many different things with so many different resources. Like basically you have all your coworkers right next to you all the time, right? Without having so much pressure. Um, and also the deliverable for the revenue making. I'm in the space where I constantly get pressure. Hey, we need to deliver this certain type of uh, feature in order to, uh, you know, keep keep the commitment for for our customers, so it directly impacts on our revenue. So I'm living in that space, but like I said, I, I would much rather be in your shoes, where I don't have to think about the the finance aspects, but rather focusing and continue to uh, to sharpen my craftsmanship. Great. Um, we have another question. Like, uh, what are the most important qualities that you look for? Oh, no, that one. What, um, when you uh, were deciding to go into this kind of work, what influenced you the most? Um, there, I have to say, there are many, many inspirations um, that I get. Uh, it's as simple as just sitting by the beach or uh, looking at others' work and doing research on, you know, benchmarks and all that stuff. But, I, you know, one thing that I've been cons consistently uh, saying is that reading is actually the best way to get your foot into understanding what's happening out in the world. Uh, what I mean by reading is not just about reading the fiction or the novel, uh, you know, the books. It's also about reading news and articles and, you know, tweets. You know, it doesn't really matter. The reading that reading is the fastest way to get you stay current and, and also stay matter to the world where the, you get to understand better about what's happening. Because again, like I mentioned this several times throughout this is that uh, watching a movie and then watching YouTube videos and consuming the media from TV, they are all good source, but at the same time, you have to think that they are all pre-canned, meaning that they have been already produced prior to what you can actually expose yourself to the future. But somebody, when somebody writes about something, uh, as soon as they hit the enter or the share, it spreads out an entire world where it takes less than a millisecond to get to you. So that, that's what I meant by it's the fastest way to stay matter to the world. And then, um, you know, you know I, I'm not a big fan of reading, to be honest with you, and I don't necessarily enjoy. But oftentimes I try to force myself just to continue reading and reading, whether it's book or the article. Um, you know, you hold your phone pretty much half the day staring at it. But I bet you most of the times you're looking at the images or the funny videos more than actually reading uh, what could be potentially really helpful for you. So, I mean, this takes some sort of disciplines. And then I'm guilty, guilty of uh, looking at those viral videos and whatnot. Uh, but like always try to kind of carve up, okay, this, I'm going to be extremely disciplined about this and not looking at those funny videos, but looking at more relevant design uh, things. In, even if you, you look at some of the, um, I would say some like, you know, famous designer posting something and then you look at it and trying to make the relevance in, in your own field and then get some inspirations. So that, that's usually how I do. And, and then again, I think the competitive benchmarking is always very, very important aspect that every single projects that I've been involved and then everything that I work with my members, I always try to do the 
the benchmarks. Like what, what is already out there? And at least try to study and understand so that you don't repeat uh, accidentally that, that somebody has already done. Great. Um, you talked about the T-shape, you know, kind of the skill sets and sometimes um, the other people saying the pie shape or the, the octopus in the kind of shape. Mm -hmm. So some of um, the questions about like um, the trends are more like a towards first tech design team member or the more like a towards specific talent and structure the team that way. So which way more like nowadays looking for those kind of skill sets? I, I would say, um, at least from my perspective, I think, um, I think we have a tendency of looking for more of a T-shape rather than the octopus, if I make it, if that's a correct analogy. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with being octopus uh, when it comes to the knowledge base. Uh, but like, if you actually put it next to each other, T-shape versus the octopus shape, I don't know if there's a whole lot of difference because you have a multiple legs where you can actually touch on many different things as, as a octopus, right? And then you get to uh, store those knowledge, but also the octopus has the huge you know, head where all this knowledge becomes centralized and then it becomes your own that you can say that this is your specialty. And I think the T-shape is in some ways, the similar analogy, you have the pole of the core competency that represent who you are, but you also are capable of many different horizontal perspective. So uh, again, you know, I particularly try to look for, and then I am extremely attracted to those talents who can confidently say, hey, I'm good at this. And I'm also aware, and I am also capable of doing other things as well. But there's gotta be one, at least one or two things that hey, this is something that I'm extremely good at. And I'm the go-to person when it comes to a to uh, particular topic. All right, so um, <clears throat> one student um, talked about the computer science and the computer programming. Um, that how much you know that, that that's like a totally engineering the world or the UX you know still the we can use that skill set for the um, the UX design so will that be beneficial for UX designer or yeah um, absolutely like the more knowledge and tools you can leverage the better you become. And then uh, I can tell you confidently that uh, as a designer, if you are aware of coding, then I, you know, I would say you're actually top of the line. Yeah. Uh, but would that be the requirements? I don't think so. Uh, when I, what I meant by you know how to code isn't necessarily I'm looking for engineering quality from designer because essentially I would like the design talent for my needs and for my company needs. Uh, but if that talent is well aware and also how to work with engineer and also understand the engineer language, then it just makes things much more easier. And then we can have a, so much more productive uh, the work and communications. You'll be surprised that uh, how difficult it is to sometimes make consensus with different disciplines. Um, I'm assuming that the school has a pool of uh, talents like engineering, mathematics, science, and you know, art and graphic designs and what, animation and whatnot, right? But like, uh, when you are working on a project, you obviously have opportunity to work with many different talent pool. But like, you think about it, like how easy was it actually? Or was it even difficult to even communicate and trying to get your idea across? Or have you actually tried or failed or succeed 
trying to convince somebody who's not in your domain knowledge, right? You're working with this one engineer and the engineer working with one designer. Are they extremely well in sync? And that's another challenge that I'm actually facing day to day. But over the course of many uh, different cases and experience, you actually start learning about how to communicate with them and then you kind of know how to put yourself in their shoes. But like in the midst of all this building relationship and collaboration, the more you are aware of other disciplines expertise, the better it becomes when, when it comes to the result of the, the work. Great. Um, the professor's, um, the song part is now um, having a 10 students and then the students are learning the Lean UX. So I'm going to have um, the professor song. Um, can you speak up and ask him for the, your question about the MVPs and all those things? Song is still on mute. Oh, yeah. I guess we, I don't have um, power to unmute. Oh, oh yeah. Here we go. <laughs> James, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, James, uh, really appreciate that you're back to SCAD. Uh, we had an amazing time two quarters ago, I think, that you visited our classes, give ample feedback to my student project. Now, one of the studio class that I'm teaching this quarter theme is about lean UX design. So we have been teaching this traditional UX design processes, but the lean UX, we focus on designing MVP, the minimum viable product. So less research, but more prototyping. And you said it uh, 10 minutes ago about prototyping, the value of it. So our focus, students focus on prototyping and massive user testing. Yeah. So uh, they would love to hear experience with that regard. It's a... I, you know, I'm really happy to hear that you guys are practicing that because that's essentially what we do all the time and nothing different than what you guys do and how you guys execute it versus how we do and execute. It's actually the same. So uh, the prototype becomes the communication tool for us. And now um, I, I said this uh, once in a while you know, we used to say the picture t tells a thousand words, right? Uh, but we now actually have passed that world. We, we don't live in that type of society anymore. So we need to make motions to tell the story rather than just putting the aesthetics up on somewhere because people staring at one image versus somebody watching a story uh, in the media form, it makes a big difference, right? So that's why in our world, in the product space, in user experience as whole, this prototyping becomes a communication tool. It's really it's the bridge between the different disciplines and different expertise and domains. So when you hand off that prototype, like making that thing, making things interactive and to someone, to be able to interact with that, that that is really the communication now, that that's the type of society and culture we're living in. So instead of you keep explaining how it works and what it is, you let them experience it so that they get to interpret on their own. So that's why the pr prototype becomes extremely important. Now, it comes down to the usability testings, right? So the prototype continues to, to, to be uh, carried on uh, quite long because now they you do communicate uh, with internal uh, your coworkers and stakeholders, and now let's say if we make all this you know beautiful consensus and then now we're going to move forward and all that, then you still have to have a tangible form to be able to do the testing. So when it comes to usability testings, at least from my case, and I think it's actually very uh, typical in a sense that. Uh, there are two different types of usability testing. One is internal, which you just pull your coworkers in and try to get very, very quick feedbacks. But, um, you know, frankly speaking, there's a lot of bias because you work for that company and you are aware of that product. 
So you kind of already know how things will actually work. And then now inevitably and unconsciously, you actually put your own taste in it. So if things doesn't work in a certain way, or if the color is slightly different than what your preference is, then the opinion becomes mixed up. Now, another thing is you bring the focus group, meaning that you reach out to external people that's outside of your company. So they're not your employees, perhaps not even your, uh, not even the family member of your employees. So reaching out to completely irrelevant, uh, the audience to get the feedbacks. Now, the critical part that we always try to be very, very conscious is that we are extremely careful about not leading uh, when it comes to focus groups. Because oftentimes when you ask questions throughout this research uh, activities, you, we actually accidentally give out the answer. Uh, because we already know what we want to hear from them and what we want to test out. So by asking certain questions in a given the task, we're kind of misleading in a way that uh, we're kind of leading our focus group to, to go to a certain direction. So that's something that we have to be extremely uh, sensitive and careful about. So making sure uh, that when you're drafting the question for somebody who's aware of what you're working on versus somebody who's completely clueless about uh, what you're working on. So the crafting the question is extremely important. I think putting a lot of opinions and feedbacks into the question is going to put you in a more of a third perspective that sort of clarifies there is no mixed uh, leading part in that question. And, and the, the more um, perspective the questions are, the, the better it is and more valuable for uh, getting the usability testings result. Great. Um, you are the one, um, I guess, perfect, um, the person to answer for this question because this question is about you know, design oriented kind of um, the culture because we both um, work for Samsung a long time and then we've been like a witness in there hardware oriented company become like a changing to the design oriented company. So um, while they are doing it, um, the student wants to hear like um, what was the, the, you know, the mistakes or, you know, transitioning period, what was the, um, you've been watching the, the, those transitions with their like uh, mistakes and the, you know, trial and error kind of thing. Um, I can share uh, my experience into twofold. One is um, getting into the design industry as a designer. Uh, the perception of being a designer nowadays is, is quite different than maybe 10, 20 years ago. Um, and per perhaps some of uh, my peers may understand and also sympathize about this feeling because uh, we used to care so much about the craftsmanship, like, you know, the beauty of being a graphic designer, the beauty of being a filmmaker that expresses art and, and uh, this psychological, the mindset that we want to indirectly communicate. But uh, may, I, I wouldn't say this is bad or, or good, but the the culture that we're living in right now, and then the whole workforce, is that everything became so much more productized uh, so that we became more of, um, you know, I, I wanna be very sensitive about this phrase, but basically I see a lot of companies making the products to be, uh, to sell, meaning like products to sell. But are there more companies that make products to be used? So there, there are two different uh, aspects. Uh, I, I would say back in the days, uh, I, I think people still care more about, hey, this is a very important product that can really help people life. 
versus now, okay, we're going to make this cool product and make sure we can sell this. Uh, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, technology has sort of embraced and sort of spoiled all of us to uh, make a lot of products that we can quickly sell that uh, gives you a quick turnaround in, in revenue. But, um, but that's one of the things that I feel like I'm actually seeing less of that, that actually make me feel a little, you know, unease, uh, I have to say. So, but because you're actually living and being pressured by, um, you know, the organizations where, you know, the state, state um, matter to the world by making the money. So that's one of the aspects that uh, I think I definitely see the different trend in here. Uh, BC, do you mind reminding me for the second part of the question? Um, you know, the, we've been like uh, seeing the, the company, like um, the big company like Samsung, hardware oriented yeah. company becoming like you know, design oriented. And we've been seeing the lots of uh, trials and errors. And so, right. yeah. yeah. So, um, I, I guess I've been extremely fortunate to be in the industries and organizations where they handle both hardware and software. Um, one of the things that I noticed, and, and perhaps all of you guys have noticed as well, is that companies like large organizations like Google, Facebook, Samsung, Apple, well, Apple has been pretty much the same but a lot of those companies have uh, somewhat switched the focus into different um, era. So Facebook being the software company, but you know, they are investing quite a bit in the hardware. You know, Oculus is one of the examples. And then Portal is another example. And Google is the same way. You know, uh, being born as a search um, software company now produce you, you can't imagine how many actually. Uh, as far as I know, they have a more than 50 different hardware products that, that they're actually cooking right now. Uh, but why do they actually do that uh, versus just continue to focus on their core strength is it's actually the market share. Uh, when somebody puts a product out there, so this is one of the examples, and then also I experienced it myself. Back when I was working at Samsung, and I, can, I think BC can actually attest to that. Um, my studio was working on a small wearable device called the Gear Fit. But when we were initiating that concept and then the work, we didn't necessarily think that that was going to become the greatest invention ever because the Fit Fit was already there, Pebble was already there, Jabra was already there. But it was more about penetrating into the market space where we can stay in matter and continue to utilize the technology that, that we, we can uh, leverage with. So hardware versus the software, I don't know if there's a, so much of the distinction that we need to worry about, but it's more about the tools. If, when you're working on the software, if you think about it, at the end of the day, when it goes out to the world, it, the software needs to live in some sort of hardware form. Right? The hardware form also needs some sort of software that operates the hardware. So it goes back and forth and everything is intertwining. Uh, as far as production cycles and then the, the actual uh, the, the, the shipping cycles, it may be a little bit di different. Like if you look at it from the 10,000 point of view, the, you know, high, then it's about the same. But the actual detail inside uh, going through the, you know, the, the feasibility testing perspective, of the hardware, and then going through the testings, and and, uh, and and then the software part. The timing is different, and then the nature is different. But again, I, I think that both are matter. The both uh, are extremely important and matter. But it's actually important where you stand. Uh, so, are you a software person? who actually focus on the user experience and then the interaction part of it. But you are still aware of the hardware because the integration is also as important as one you know, on the other. 
So hard, as a hardware person, let's say if you're an industrial designer, can you actually understand a little bit about user experience that you can leverage with? Because there's a lot of the hardware and software integrations that's actually being neglected. The software looks, looks very much like it's living in, this, in its own world where it doesn't necessarily blend well with the hardware. So both are important, but it's important for uh, people like us to actually stand on one space where you know how to represent yourself with your domain expertise, but also being aware of what's actually happening uh, on the other side. All right, so um, another question, a little bit more like a leadership kind of question. And since you are the head of um, the design and head of UX, and uh, one question was, um, what does it really mean to be a leader of design team or managing a project? So how do you lead teams during stressful times? Or what are the most important things for a leader? Um, first and foremost, I don't really enjoy being in the leadership. <laughs> it's not fun. Uh, there, are, there are too many um, errands you need to run that are not necessarily pleasant and fun. Uh, but, you know, over the course of your career, you will eventually evolve and become more mature to be responsible for a different uh, caliber. I now uh, run an organization with, you know, many members that I need to determine how I want to operate. If I let's say if I have 25 people, but those 25 people are not necessarily in one location. So in my case right now, I'm working with folks in UK and also folks in India and folks in, in different states in, in, in America. So I'm constantly juggling my time, how I can consolidate this time so that at least we can have some overlapping time where everybody feels comfortable being together throughout this Zoom uh, conference call. And also another thing is how much care should I actually give? Um, so I do one-on-ones with my members every single day uh, for like maybe half hour in order for me to, you know, uh, connect with the individual designers I basically have to do at least one or two one-on-ones every single day. And then it spreads out early morning versus late night. Um, the qualities that I try to develop myself as being in this position is, is actually about the compassion. Uh, how much do I actually understand this individual? Uh, and also how, how much of the mentorship can I provide for them to continue to grow. Um, I, I, do, I do say this a lot, that at the end of the day, what I truly care about for any of the members that I work with is for me to actually help them to become the best version of themselves, uh, not necessarily changing who they are. Uh, they're all talented people, and otherwise I probably wouldn't even hire anyone. So I do have a trust in them. Uh, so I with that trust, I, you know, I also have the expectation. Uh, so I give them the empowerment without micromanaging that they can have the ownership of what they do and then have the pride in and how they actually want to communicate about what they do. Um, I think one of the th also th things is, th is that uh, when it comes to leadership, um, you, you, you have... I have to say, you better off being very, very communicative. Um, I think I mentioned a little bit about being introvert versus extrovert. I'm a very introvert person as well, although it may not look that way, but the position sometimes kind of reinforces you to become somebody more than who you are. So the important part of the, what I just said is it, Becoming more than who you are is different than becoming somebody else other than who you are. So I never ever try to change who my folks are, but I always try to help them to adjust who they are so that they can become more than who they are and then become the best version of themselves. 
uh, this is more the philosophical aspect of, you know, being a leader, like, you know, the, the more about the emotional perspective. There is also a tangible perspective where, you know, a lot of times you just got to get the job done, but you have the, the dependencies on your members delivering the work, right? So I would say, um, you, you know, oftentimes you have to be very assertive. You have to be very clear on what you're asking and what the deliverables are expected in timely manner and without actually forcing them and choking their neck, hey, where is this thing? And then when is then it going to come? You have to give them the enough space for them to be able to execute. And that's the part where it becomes extremely challenging because you don't control that actually. Uh, so have, have more communications and that's what I meant by like being more communicative. Uh, be able to express what your concern is and also be able to hear what their concern is. And sometimes being a good listener is better than the speaker as a leader. Yep. Um, time's flying. So we will take one more question and then the, I guess we have three more questions, but we don't have time. So if you can send me your email, then I will connect to the James and James can answer your question. So another question from graphic design student. Um, one of our students, a graphic design major, but she's transitioning UX, and um, she wants to know more more about like, um, do you have any recommendation for those people who are transitioning from graphic design to UX? Is there anything to reinforce? Um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily transitions I can consider. Uh, so I can tell you my own case. Uh, so back when I was in college, I studied the visual language. And then uh, halfway through the college, I switched my major to film. And then after graduation, I got a job at advertising company. And then after that, and I got interest, I got hooked on to becoming an aspiring director uh, to being in the film set. And then as I was getting into the film set, I realized that there is a more fun thing to do like the visual effects and the film editing. So as you can see the trend, like the trend of my career has very much um, ups and downs. And then, um, you know, like warm, uh, you know, zigzag. But one thing that has never changed is actually being in the design discipline. And then keeping that design this uh, principle all the way um, as, as part of my own integrity that has really helped me to, to stay where I am today. So I wouldn't necessarily say that's a transition, but that's, I would actually take that as an opportunity to really expand your capacity of domain knowledge. You being the graphic designer, thinking about the art perspective, you know, obviously you are gonna be extremely tasteful about colors, and fonts and shapes and then layouts and whatnot, utilize that. Utilize for, to, to, to do more than the graphic design. So start thinking about the structural perspective. Now it's time to think about the visual hierarchy. Like what does it really mean to have a good user experience thinking about uh, what end user is going to uh, think and interpret and how they're going to use the product that you are going to produce. So like you're just expanding the capacity and then have, a, you know, learn more about like different domain knowledge other than you're actually transitioning. Because I can tell you like guaranteed that at some point in time, someone like me is going to ask you, hey, can you actually uh, put some visuals in this? Even if you are full time UX designer. Because that's all like, you know, it comes down to multidisciplinary uh, designer that we all aspire to become. And then that's why the T-shape is extremely important. That maybe the graphic design domain knowledge is your pull of the, the T. And then the other things that you are going to, um, you know, expand to is going to become the roof of the T. So, I wouldn't necessarily consider it as a transition, but you're going to continue to expand your domain and area to become more than who you were before as a designer. 
Um, we have three more minutes, but um, it's like a related on the question from the graphic design. So can you shortly answer? Um, you know, lots of students, even UX students, some of students are worrying about you know, learning the codings are very difficult. And then why we have to learn that one? And then what is the, the, you know, the beneficial learning that? So can, if you can answer like a shortly, um, if you will, um, why um, the, the graphic design student or the UX design student, um, they have to learn the codings and that coding matter for UX design. Yeah, I think we touched a little bit about this whole coding aspect as a designer. But again, it really comes down to your own will to uh, really expand your capacity of knowledge. Like I said, the more you know, the better it is. Because oftentimes when you are working with different disciplines, um, they're going to always hinge their focus into somebody who they can actually communicate better. So if you um, know the coding nature, like at least understand the shallow level of a programming perspective, that then you can actually speak better and then have better communications. And then, you know, frankly speaking, you, you are going to have more credibility uh, and, and, and also respect from other disciplines. So, um, I, again, like I highly encourage, when, when you have an opportunity to learn anything new, never hesitate. Great. Um, it's already like uh, time's up. So we want to hear forever, but you know, lots of um, students having other um, the events going on. So we'll um, wrap up here. And um, that was um, the great, so we can, um, express our thanks to the James. James, thanks for your um, attending today and give us a great um, the speak. And um, so um, thanks and uh, also all of you and um, please join, um, you know, the lots of other the future, um, the guest and gusto events also, you can check from the, the SCAT, um, the website and have a great day. Thank you everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me here. It was a pleasure. And good luck, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>